There's part of the Christmas story that you've probably never heard before, but could change your life and bring you peace this Christmas. Merry Christmas, by the way, I'm Kyle, this is Crossroads. And whether you're watching this on Christmas Day, Christmas Eve, whenever, I have a question. Do you know the story of Christmas? I mean, sure, you know Mary and Joseph and Jesus, of course, but what about everyone else? In fact, who is everybody else? That's what today is. We're uncovering three unknown characters of the Christmas story who are seemingly unrelated and discovering how they're not only deeply connected to each other, but also to Jesus. We'll see how Elizabeth was visited by an angel, how Gabriel was waiting hundreds of years to deliver an impossible message of hope, how Herod tried to stop it all from happening, and how the Christmas story changes everything for our lives today and can unlock the peace you and I need this Christmas. So there are some heavy hitters in the Bible. You've got big names that we know. You've got Mary, you've got Joseph, and of course, Jesus. Now the name that you won't hear and you haven't heard is Elizabeth, but she is in fact a part of the Christmas story. See, Elizabeth was married to this guy named Zachariah and they were both very old and unable to have children. I mean, I'm talking old, at the age where all the eggs are hard, boiled, cracked, the soldiers are not marching. And the Bible says that Elizabeth is well past childbearing age and that would have been scientifically impossible for her to have a kid. Absolutely, like I just said, soldiers aren't moving. She would have been woefully and humiliatingly barren to this point, just not able to have a kid. Imagine what that would have felt like to be barren, to be to know that that's the one thing you want and you can't have it. And yet Elizabeth was considered faithful. She was a woman who was righteous before God. Even though she didn't get the thing that she wanted most in life, she still regarded God as good. See, just like Mary, which happens way earlier in the Christmas story, Elizabeth and her husband were visited by an angel, the angel Gabriel. And we're gonna uncover what happens next and how it changed everything. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all of the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they both were very old. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. This scene is crazy. An angel shows up and intersects the story of Elizabeth when he talks to her husband, Zechariah. His name is Gabriel. He's an eternal being. If you look at the Bible, angels appear to have this existence completely different than us. The Bible has sections that talk about what happened before the beginning of the world, and the angels were there in that part of the story, and it has sections about after the end of the world, and the angels are there. He's this cosmic scale being. By the way, I find this interesting. Angels in the Bible are often seen and symbolized as the stars. There's this eternal weight and scale to them that's just mind-blowing. He shows up to deliver this message, a message that, by the way, he'd been waiting a long time to deliver. Millennia. Finally, the day arrives. This cosmic being shows up and his scale, his sheer size, it scares Zechariah so bad. He just gets all freaked out. You know, angels aren't these little chubby babies with wings flying around, super cute. It's like this mind-blowingly large Navy SEAL shows up and then tells him this good news about the future that seems too good to be true. And in that moment, 
Zechariah does what we all do when we hear news that's too good to be true. He balks. Luke 1.18 says, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. Him and Elizabeth, they, they were in a, a, a desert. It was, it was dark in their life. They've been hoping for a baby for decades, decades. How many times had Elizabeth thought she was pregnant only to be let down? How many miscarriages had they been through in their journey? And so with an angel of God standing in front of him, Zechariah basically says, man, I don't believe you. I mean, at one point in my, in my life, I, I, I hope for something better, but the night has set in. If, and if I hope for the morning, if I hope for dawn, if I hope to be able to see, I'm just going to be let down. And so it's going to be easier for me, Gabriel, if I just say, I don't buy it. Safer for me here. Gabriel's response to Zechariah says this. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. I'm Gabriel. I stand with God. I'm giving you his words and I'm telling you they will come true at their time. They will. I just wonder about you in your life. Is there a place where you've heard the word of God? You've seen a promise in the Bible and, or a video like this or coming to church and at one point you believe for better. You believe that you could live life and not feel alone. You believe that, that you could actually feel hope and peace and, and, and not just feel so numb all the time. You believe that. But now, after being let down so many times, you just, just not sure. Maybe it's just easier to, to just decide it's going to be dark, you know? Just, just live out here alone by yourself. If you hope for the morning, you're just going to be let down. But here's the good news. The plans of God cannot be changed. And it's good news. Good news. Somebody tried to stop God's plans? A guy named King Herod. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where the Christ was to be born. Herod is this ruler who's overseeing the Jews under the authority of the Romans. And it's appropriate that this starts. He, by the way, he's an awful ruler. He's a bad ruler. He's got a major ego complex. He hurts everybody around him. He has zero peace in his life. He makes sure everybody around him doesn't have peace. And this whole story well, that verse we read starts with the phrase, in the days of Herod. Everything is about him and people know that day is him because he is an authority figure that's hurting people around him. But in reality, he's really not that powerful at all. His city, his wealth, his status, it all ended up like ancient ruins. And this is the way it is with us. We could actually do a little adaptation here and say, in the days of Brian, in the days of Michelle, in the days of Eduardo, in the days of Lakeisha, someday everything that's around us will end up as rubble. And it behooves us to get on the page of God and Christmas reminds us that there is a page called God, actually it's called King Jesus. Christmas is about the kingdom of God being built and nothing can stop that. And when God promises anything, including a deliverer or a savior, He's going to deliver. Luke 1 says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. 
But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. So Gabriel shows up a second time in the Christmas story. And he's got the same assignment as the first time when he showed up to Zechariah. Deliver what seems like impossible news to somebody about a good thing God's going to do. If you're Gabriel, you're probably hoping like, man, I hope this one goes better than the last one. I hope I don't have to make anybody not able to speak or something. I hope, I hope Mary just says, cool. But that's not what happens. She has the same response as Zechariah. How will I know that this is true? How, how can I be sure? I'm, I'm too young. This doesn't make any sense. And Gabriel gives her the same response he gives to Zechariah, but, but he sharpens it a little bit. He sharpens it and he says, no word from God will ever fail. It's the final line we ever get from Gabriel in the entire Bible. It's his thesis statement, so to speak. It's his message to humanity over thousands of thousands of years and today to you and to me. No word from God will ever fail. None. Now, you might open your Bible in app and you might see a different translation because this verse is actually translated a few different ways. The English Standard Version says, for nothing will be impossible with God. If you pair the translations to get together, what you get is this understanding that if God has said it, it won't be impossible. It will happen. I just wonder about your life. What, what in your life has God promised that seems impossible to you? That star can happen for you right now. Just say, yes, God, I, I choose to believe. I will believe. Gabriel was God's messenger sent to deliver the good news at Christmas, that the impossible is possible. I'm telling you, it happened then, and it can happen now. It's possible for you. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zacharias' home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. So the angel Gabriel talks to Mary, and this is a part of the Christmas story that we know. And he tells her about her relative, Elizabeth. And Mary gets excited and she hurries to go see her. And then impossible things start happening. See, Elizabeth was in a time of seclusion before she saw Mary. The Bible says that she became pregnant and then she went to seclusion. It doesn't really say why, it doesn't go into the details, but coming out of her seclusion, the very first visitor that she has is Mary. And when she hears the voice of Mary, the baby inside of her leaps. And Elizabeth, I mean, straight up loses it. She gets super excited. I imagine her jumping up for joy, maybe turning around three times. And because she starts praising God all over the place. And I think she does this because perhaps it's the first time she felt the baby move. See, that hint in the Bible about seclusion could be for a lot of reasons, but I think it's because Elizabeth was on bed rest. I think that she had not felt the baby move at all and maybe had assumed that the baby was still born. Imagine what that would have felt like to have been down this road long before time and time and time and time again where you were trying and asking God to do something for you and you would get to the point where maybe there was a baby inside of you but you didn't know if it was gonna happen, if it was gonna see the light of day. See, if the baby was still born, Elizabeth would have absolutely no way of knowing. She would have no way of getting it out. There wasn't a C-section line or an ultrasound machine. She couldn't call her OB and say, hey brother, I think something is going on. 
imagine what she was thinking. Is she thinking, is God good? Would he allow me to have this baby inside of me and not let me feel its life? I think Elizabeth had given up. I think she had called it quits. I think she was in that seclusion saying, you know what, this is the last time. I know I'm old. I shouldn't even be able to have this kid, but here I am and I give up. And that's why it's so much more important when Mary arrives. See, because Mary is carrying the good news. Mary is carrying life and the light of the world. And so the word of God is present in Elizabeth's house. And when that happens, the life inside of Mary makes the life inside of Elizabeth respond and her baby leaps. Elizabeth's story is the impossible being made possible, which is the Christmas story. It's impossible things happening all over the place. And that is the story of Jesus. See, Elizabeth's story sets the stage for a coming king who would constantly do impossible things for years and years and ages to come. Her story and her miracle all lead up to the birth of Jesus that would change everything. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Jesus is born the day that we know as Christmas. Christmas is here, but it's not the end of the story. Christmas is about God's promise of peace, real peace found in resolving your conflict with King Jesus. And how you and I react to the king determines whether or not you'll have peace. Here we see how King Herod reacts to the arrival of King Jesus. Uh, he, he really didn't want to worship Jesus. He just says that so he can find him and actually kill him. He's always trying to exert his authority, his power, his might, his wealth by whatever he drives or he doesn't drive, whatever chariots he drives, or whatever he builds. Herod says, bring this kid to me, this baby king. I hear he's a king. They bring him to me. I want to worship him. He doesn't want to worship him. He wants to kill him. The Magi refuse to do it. They take off. So Herod goes to Bethlehem and he wipes out all of the infants in the area. He said, if Jesus is one of them, I'm going to get him. Kills them all. Crazy thing is that while Herod didn't get his wish in killing Jesus as an infant, the good news is there's no human leader, no matter how powerful, who can beat the plan of God. Jesus' birth at Christmas, while Herod tried to stop it, it changed everything for the world. My life is different. Yours may be as well. People you know, people in every corner of the globe in every time history and see how King Jesus impacted them. Not just back then, but now. Everything can change for you this Christmas. The birth of Jesus changed the world 2,000 years ago. But the miracle of Jesus is not far away or ancient or mythical. Christmas is here and now, as miraculous today as the day Jesus was born. It changes our world today by changing us. The good news of Christmas is that the birth of Jesus changes everything. It changes chaos to peace, fear to love, despair to hope, doubt to faith. God could have rescued the world by force and power. He could have used a king or a conqueror, but instead God chose Mary, a teenage girl, to give birth to Jesus, the promised Savior. It was a miracle, and Mary believed and rejoiced. Mary's fiancé Joseph did not understand what God had done. He doubted and planned to divorce her quietly. But God sent an angel to tell him that the child Mary carried was from the Holy Spirit and that this child would save his people from their sins. This was amazing news. This was not easy news. Mary and Joseph let the power of God transform their hearts from doubt to faith.
God actually came to the world, which is what Christmas celebrates, everything is changed. Our hopes, our dreams, our aspirations, the importance of the things I get stressed out about right now, it all changes. Birth of Jesus changes everything and that everything previous in world history has been leading up to this moment. It's why we date time after him. All of these other characters were all part of God's plan and the story at Christmas, they all contributed to the Christmas story in a big way. Elizabeth, she shows that by faith, the impossible was made possible. Gabriel was preparing to deliver this message of news for hundreds of years, even somebody who wasn't human, an angel. Herod tried to stop it and ultimately he failed. Herod later goes on to die a brutal death that I detailed a lot in the previous episode. You probably wanna check that out. I wanna talk about it right now, because this is Christmas. I might gross you out on Christmas. But his kingdom is in ruins. Jesus lived on as the Savior and the Son of God, and God overcame the evil in this world, the evil that was personified in Herod, and replaced it with peace. The Prince of Peace. Who gets to be under the rule of the Prince of Peace? Anybody who would put themselves under the rule of King Jesus. In the book of John, chapter 1, verse 12 to 13, it says this. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. When we come into relationship with Jesus, it's not a human decision, it's a godly decision. He's been wooing us. And we come into his family, we're born into his family. It's not of our own might, not of our own power of the power of God coming under the rule of Jesus. You and I can choose to either be like Herod and hold tight to your little bit of power, or you can choose the peace that Jesus gives by coming into our lives. Last year and a half been so stressful because I've, I've tried to hold on, hold on to the life that I wanted to have, hold on to the way I thought life should be operating. I just, just holding on tight, clench fists, like Herod was, like maybe you are. We get so angry and so upset because we're 
coming under the rule of ourselves, having things the way we want it. And when we're like that and upset, we can't be at peace. We can't have peace with people who are around us. We can't have peace with ourselves. But when we come under, under the authority of King Jesus, there is a power and a peace that passes all understanding. So how are you going to react and respond to the story of Jesus? Is this going to be just a, another religious holiday where you sing the same songs, you do the same things, and you open the same presents, and you, you wish somebody gave you better presents? This is going to be the same thing where you're with people who drain you maybe out of towners or something like that, or the same thing where you, where you have a drink or two too many because it's Christmas after all, and then you just repeat the same year again, and it goes on and it goes on. Or would this be different where there's a new way, a new thing you could do, a new thing of putting yourself under the rule of Jesus? I hope you choose that. I hope you don't just keep doing the same old, same old. I want your life to be better. Jesus wants your life to be better. He wants you to come under his authority and have the power that only he offers. You've never given your life to him or you want to give your life to him in a fresh way right now. Let me pray for you and you can just kind of say this prayer after me. Say, King Jesus, I want you in my life. I want your kingdom to come in my life. I release my grip on all the things that I've been trying to control and overpower. And I ask you to forgive me for operating by my power and doing things that I just shouldn't have done. Fill me with your spirit. And the best I can, I'll follow you the rest of my life. Amen. When that happens, there's just sort of a sort of a calm that comes to us. I cracked a little bit earlier on some of our traditions that might just be mindlessly done again and again. But one of the wonderful things about Christmas is that there are traditions that are really meaningful. Opening gifts around a tree can be incredibly meaningful. So also can singing a classic song that people in churches and people of faith all over the world are singing right now. It's a Christmas tradition for us it's called Silent Night, and it can bring us peace. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round your virgin That silent night means that there's hope and peace available to you. If you prayed that prayer for the first time or you wanna know more about what it means to follow Jesus, just chat with us at our website. Listen, I believe that this next year could be the year that will change your life. We'd love to help with that. We're more than just an episode once a week. Crossroads is a movement that you can fully belong to no matter where you live. We believe that God designed you to live a life of purpose and adventure. If you wanna know more and to access everything we have to offer, just sign up by going to online.crossroads.net. Now, Crossroads is funded by people who believe in what we're doing and wanna see more of it. If you're a giver, I wanna say thank you. And if you wanna join this mission, you can do it by giving. Just go to crossroads.net slash give. You know, we're making a difference across the country and around the world. And we would love if you would consider including Crossroads in your year in giving this Christmas. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and we'll see you next week on Crossroads. There is a way that leads to life. It's not the paved path, well lit, well traveled, known. It's the ancient path, narrow, forgotten, wild. Few are willing to walk it. But those who do find what they've been searching for. Be one of them. Walk the way that leads to life and find faith in a faithless world. 
this January at Crossroads. There's part of the Christmas story that you've probably never heard before, but could change your life and bring you peace this Christmas. Subscribe to get our latest episodes and hear more like this every week. And to keep watching, click right here. See you in a second.